Hello, this is Branko Malic of Kali Tribune with the second segment of our series of Nicolas of Cusas or Nicolas Cusanus de Visione Dei. We'll try to go in media stress, uh, not to do a lot of uh, reiterating of things we said uh, previously, so I do implore you if you are new to this series. Uh, give a listen to our first podcast because we are reading the text here and not going back upon the things we already uh, did away with. Uh, just in in uh, in preface, uh, something uh, a technical and uh, note concerning Kali Tribune in general, especially to our beneficia uh, our benevolent donors who help out, uh, help us out and support Kali Tribune, I I will be uh, trying to get some better mic and better, in general, better better technical equipment uh, come ne- uh, beginning next month, in 10 days maybe, maybe a little more. And thank you very much to all of you. I won't, uh, say, I won't say no names because some people don't like to be called out in public and... Uh, I support them in that uh, in that attitude, but hearty thanks to everybody who supports Kali Tribune. So, with that out of our way, let's talk about Cusanus. So, just in a short introduction, we were talking about Cusanus. Uh, uh, let's call it theological exercise of uh, uh, analysis let's say ritual even analysis of god's sight of the vision of god in both uh, subject subject uh, subjective objectivus and genitive uh, objectivus uh, sense uh, to understand what this means please uh, refer to our first video and now we'll see how kuzanus proceeds so the monks were told to fasten the icon, uh, that is to say, uh, the painting on the north wall, uh, to make a semicircle around it and then go different ways. And then after going different ways, consulting who was followed by the eyes of the icon. And, of course, the uh, conclusion is everybody was followed, which means that the sight of icon is omnivoyant, that is to say, is image icona, uh, the veritable image of omnivoyance, of what Nicholas would call later on absolute sight. And implications are numerous. In this video, uh, we won't exhaust even a fraction of those impl- implications. We'll just uh, see how Nicholas f- moves forward, makes a step beyond a sensual image. Uh, both in objective and subjective sense of uh, property or the energy of God. And uh, without further ado, let's say what he says. <clears throat> Whatever is apparent with regard to the icon of God's sight is truer with regard to God's true sight. For indeed, God who is the summit of all perfection and who is greater that can be taught, is called Theos, by virtue of the fact that he observes all things. Therefore, if in the image the depicted gaze can appear, please note the word appear, to be beholding each and everything at once, then, since this capability belongs to sight's perfection, it cannot truly befit the truth less than it apparently befits the icon or appearance. Now, please note, this is very medieval kind of thinking. This is something you would uh, that would be called sophism in modern philosophy, perhaps, because this is something. This is uh, making a causa. This is taking analogy or likeness as a causal relation. We talked about this in the first segment, <coughs> and now you see uh, where it leads him. So, if the icon that is like its prototype, its archetype, has appearance of omnivoyance, then prototype indeed has the real omnivoyance, that is to say, or better to be more precise and more methodical in the way Nicholas is, uh, we can say that we must assume 
that the omnivoyant sight portrayed in appearance in a trick of colors uh, is infinitely more perfect. Infinitely, uh, it, it, we must say if infinitely because it transcends infinitely. Uh, and Nicola uh, is talking here about one intermediary step be, uh, before talking about this uh, this unconditioned, uncontracted sight. So this is what he say. For suppose I view abstract sight, which mentally I have freed from all eyes and organs. Mentally I have freed. We'll return to this, please note. And suppose I consider the fact that this abstract sight in its own contracted being, according as those who see, see by means of sight, is contracted to time, to the regions of the world, to individual objects, and to other such conditions, and the fact that likewise abstract sight is free from these conditions, thereupon I rightly grasp that it is not of the essence of sight that sight beholds one object more than another, even though the fact that while sight inspects one object, uh, it cannot at the same time inspect either another object or all other objects whatsoever characterizes sight in its contracted being. Please note this word also, contracted. But God, insofar as he is true uncontracted sight, is not sight that is less than the intellect can conceive abstract sight to be. Rather, he is incomparably more perfect sight. Please note this incomparably. Now, let us interpret. First, what he's doing here, this is something that Greeks, both philosophers and later Christian theologians, called a phyresis. A phyresis means peeling off uh, in somewhat uh, liberal translation. Uh, peeling off what? What he says, I mentally have freed from all eyes and organs. This is the mental act of abstraction. But please note, this is very important, abstraction is a very loaded word today. What it means is the literal um, peeling off or subtracting the sensible, sensual, sense experience material from something. Um, uh, extrapolation of the intelligible structure of sensual thing in this sense, image. And by the way, this I forgot to say this, about picture painting they're using. I studied Kuzanus a long time ago and still haven't known, I wasn't sure about this painting. Uh, people speculated that it's auto-portrait of Roger van der Weyden, but as I learned in uh, quite recently, it uh, the, the scholarly consensus uh, leans towards uh, uh, a version of Veronica's scarf, that is to say, uh, the image uh, that uh, portrays a Jesus face. So it is, in fact, an icon, uh, truly icon of Christ. So uh, I put in the show notes one article, one very good article that, among other things, touches on this subject, so you can consult it. So what Nicholas is doing here is a real act. Uh, intellect performs this act of uh, grasping the essence, the species, uh, the uh, quiddity, the usia of something uh, as a real act. It's not abstraction in the sense that we subjectively construct the concept as is understood today. No, 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 no. This is extrapolating what is already there. It is analogous in, to some extent to, to the very uh, sense, sense experience, but it is higher than, than it. And this is quite normal because in this kind of thinking, uh, nothing is isolated from anything else, else because causality works on the principle of likeness. So likeness is the main cause. Nothing and a likeness guarantees that nothing can absolutely diverge from God. 
except in one special sense and that's something we'll talk about at the very end of this series. Uh, so when he does this, he liberates sight, in inverted commas and quote unquote liberates, from its sense con con contractions. So sight, for instance, my sight is contracted, contracted by my body and by its objects and by place in uh, time and space. I am, my sight is uh, being acting, being uh, emanating its energia, its action, its proper purpose. But abstract sight would be sight that uh, that is uh, archetype or exemplar of any sight, human sight, let's say, for the sake of argument, or sight in general. And this kind of sight is one step further from what we sense experience. So there is this relation of uh, these uh, observers and the icon. Whereupon we are better to uh, understand uh, the relation that icon is watching them than that they are watching icon. This is how this should be understood. This is called inverse perspective, inverted perspective, because in normal sense experience, we try to, we have this imaginary so-called vanishing point, that is to say this uh, point where two parallels meet in the distance. They don't meet, but they have this illusion of meeting that is constantly vanishing. In this uh, instance, it's another way around because vanishing point is the eyes of the icon. This is uh, all en encompassing vanishing point. Uh, vanishing point that is not uh, being absolutely cost contracted, but it's absolutely... Uh, extra uh, extending to infinity that is infinite so this is uh, so why we uh, this is why we call it inverted perspective mind you this is a renaissance people say that renaissance killed off this kind of thinking uh, judging by nicolas cousanus as one of the most influential christian thinkers uh, uh, truly orthodox catholic thinker orthodoxly catholic thinkers uh, uh, the thing, uh, the, the matters stand complete in complete opposition to this prejudice. Uh, let us remember that. We won't go into far-flung uh, historical observations here, but this is something to note. And I'm, of course, not the first one to note this. Because Nicholas entered the Renaissance without leaving Middle Ages. Not for one second did he step out from the Middle Ages. Yet, he brought new forms to express things. So, abstract sight is, as he says here, free from these sensual conditions, but it is not free in itself. It is not uncontracted because it has to be in time. It has to... Uh, in place, it has to observe the object one after another. And this is very important because time is the main thing. Time is, is for instance, when you talk about discursive logical thinking, and some people like to say that it is not imperfect, that is mechanical. It is not mechanical. It was not understood as mechanical, these chains of syllogism. They were understood as temporal. This is very important because this is the... Uh, the relation between uh, what is divine and what is on the other side, what is higher and that which is secular and in the world and what is lower is the relationship between eternity and time, primarily. So when we say that we have to make something that we can Im imagine as a chain of inferences or chain of, in this case, visions, is such because of time, of temporality, not because of being mechanical. This is very important to bear in mind because time itself is something that cannot be detached from eternity. You cannot think it properly without taking eternity into play. This is very important. This is very fluid. Time is very fluid thing. And this fluidity is something that kind of gives you 
serves as a surface for a deeper plunge, a deeper dive into something that from which time stands. Just a note, of course. So God's sight would be uncontracted sight. And it has to be higher than abstract sight that intellect can conceive, because we can conceive this sight that is liberated for, from any given eyes, so to speak. But yet, as such, it is not God's sight. God's sight is still represented by what we saw in the icon. So it is omnivian sight that is watching everybody and uh, at the same time not moving, not having to uh, watch one after another, but everything at the same time, everybody at the same time. So Nicholas will describe it for us. But sight that is free from all contractedness as being the most adequate measure and the most true exemplar of all acts of seeing encompasses at one and the same time each and every mode of seeing for without absolute sight, there cannot be contracted sight. But absolute sight encompasses all modes of seeing, encompasses all modes in such way that it encompasses each mode. Let us remember this. And it remains altogether free from all variation. For in absolute sight, every contracted mode of seeing is present uncontractedly. Let us remember this too, because we'll get back to it. For all contraction of sight is present in absolute sight, because absolute sight is the contraction of contractions. For it is uncontractible contraction. Therefore, most simple contraction coincides with absolute sight. Now, without contraction, nothing is contracted. Thus, absolute sight is present in all seeing. Since all contracted sight exists through absolute sight and cannot exist, at all exist without it. Now, this is one step beyond the, this is the ultimate step beyond what we can see. He started, as we talk in first, talked about in the first segment with what can be seen. And on the, using the ladder of likeness, he climbs up and now he comes to where the things will radically change. And you'll see in the third, segment in very interesting way the narrative the way he speaks will change uh, uh, in philosophical text it is of paramount importance to watch not only what is said but how it is said the mode or form of expression in great philosophers like this and uh, this one uh, and we'll talk we won't touch it now because it will be very interest uh, very um poignant we'll need more time for this so what he's saying here that God's sight, God, God as sight, has no contractedness, uh, but uh, it encompasses all modes of seeing, because it is not contracted, it's omnivoyant, but in such a way that encompasses each mode. And this is very important. It is one simple and, and simple for, for one sole reason, because it is unique. And being unique, being one, doesn't mean uh, being reduced to atom or monad. This is something you would get in modern philosophy. It means to be so encompassing that you can. it can be only one. There can be no two gods, no two absolute sides. And this comes to pass because it encompasses each mode. When it says each mode, it encompasses all people. So it cannot be, uh, 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 it is the most concrete, most present reality, the most present energia you can find in this world because it is everywhere. In, in not in a special, spatial sense, but in essential sense. Nothing can be without it. Uh, it conser this is very important. When we, say, uh, when we say nothing can be without it, I mean, Nicholas, uh, we'll see in other, other segments, uh, he addresses this explicitly. Uh, being doesn't only mean being 
brought into being. It means being conserved in the being, in the being. Absolute or eternal sight, eternal vision or eternal gaze conserves and keeps in existence each contracted gaze. And this is, in this sense, uh, equivalent with each man. And it remains all together free from all variation. This doesn't mean the, uh, that, that, that God's sight is, is some petrified uh, one that has no content in it. On the contrary, it means uh, precisely the opposite. It is free from all variation because it contracts variation. It creates variation. This makes it free. And every variation that exists, every mode that, of every, everything that exists is always in unity with it, with him. Cannot be divorced uh, out of this unity except in one special case. For in absolute sight, every contracted mode of seeing is present uncontractedly. So God uh, uh, resolves every implication of every being in himself. Not in that being itself, but in himself, in God. These things, the time, the temporality, which is the main contraction, in my opinion. The main contraction that makes us humans humans is resolved into eternity in God. So, the absolute sight is a contraction of contractions because contractions make each individual being individual being. Uh, they are, uh, our temporality and our mortality, if you like, is what makes us, our limits are what makes us what we are. We have to have them. But in God, these, those limits are absolved. So, Contractions are contracted. Negation is negated. This is, well, mystical theology. So we have something completely different. Something that is, just to jump ahead a bit, an object of doctor ignorantia, of learned ignorance, of knowing, of unknow positive unknowing. Uh, And so we'll stop reading here. As you see, I'm uh, pacing very slowly, uh, not that slowly, but sh uh, in very short bursts <laughs> with Nicholas Cousins because this is very poignant. So what we have here is that he performs this, this, this mystical exercise and uh, this mystical exercise now goes to de uh, deeper and at the same time, higher level. And this higher level is first a phyresis, uh, reaching the notion of sight as something real, and then overreaching above it to what it uh, points. And this is this omnivoyant sight, which is not now not observed as an icon, but as something that is uh, contracted in the icon. And this contractedness means, this word contraction means being created, in, in fact. And being created in Christianity doesn't mean created and left alone. Because every, all of this would be impossible uh, to do for a Catholic uh, thinker uh, if uh, there would be no connection, causal or Origi origins connection between this absolute or this, I don't like this word absolute much, but this, this uh, supreme and the highest and that which is below it. In our next episode, we'll, uh, things will take uh, the really interesting turn and that's when Nicholas will tr start to speak in a somewhat different language and we'll see uh, one very interesting implication uh, that is you know, rather explicit in his narrative, that is to say the implication that faith and that the object of this exercise can be reached, that is God and salvation, only in community. 
this is something that is implied in this in 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 this in this exercise and this is very interesting and i think extremely important and uh, very often uh, neglected by people who are interested precisely in mysticism because interest in mysticism is in fact uh, a long enduring fashion in the west mysticism of any form and when you read a real mystic like this one you see how off the mark this fashion is namely that mysticism is anything but individualistic uh, with this thought uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll end up with this segment hope it was informative i hope you were able to follow through it's a, it can get a bit difficult at times but i think that reading of the text uh, in this video form and explaining it sentence by sentence is the best way to understand these things. It is closest thing to seminary on the on the, on the university we can get uh, on Kali Tribune. Thank you for your attention. This was Branko Malic for Kali Tribune signing out.